day uh, by you can outsource timekeeping to me. Uh, so thank you, Tony. What makes more sense? Do you like a like a would you like a five minute warning or like a ten minute warning before break time? Uh, five minutes would be good. Five minutes, cool. I will make sure I keep an eye on the clock, or Hi. that somebody else does. Thanks, Matt. I'm just pasting the link to the Etherpad for people who are joining. You can sign in below line um, 40 for day two. Morning to everyone who's just joined. The link to the Etherpad document, hi John, is hi. in the chat now. So if you can just sign in for a day two, please, that would be great. I'm just waiting for the others to join us. Great, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. My name's Tony May. Um, I'm a fellow at the University of Edinburgh in the School of Chemistry, and I've been doing these Python carpentries for over two years now. Um, my day-to-day -day, uh, job is uh, a computational chemist, and I do a lot of Python analysis and program writing, so I'm quite an experienced Python programmer, for sure. Um, probably not so much in terms of acoustics, but... Um, Anyway, so in order to get started today, just a sort of very brief show of hands um, or green stickers. How many of you have run any kind of Python before? Mm -hmm. So we have a, a good mix of people. Cool. Um, well, I think we're going to go through the material at hopefully a pace that works for everyone. If you uh, do have any questions at any point, please do interrupt me. Uh, if you want me to explain something again, or if I'm going too fast, please let me know. Um, the whole workshop is for your benefit and not uh, for me talking at a screen. So um, yeah, let's get started. I'm going to start with a very brief sort of introduction around um, Python. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, at this point, you can hopefully now see my screen. Fantastic. So the schedule for today is very straightforward. We're basically going to have um, Python break, Python break, Python. Um, the idea is sort of roughly to do about an hour's worth of, of Python, then have a 15 minute break um, twice. And then ideally we'll wrap up by 12.45. Um, Matthew will help us with timekeeping today. So you should all be ready to have lunch no later than one o'clock today for sure. So, um, what is programming and coding? Uh, so this is something I've kind of always wondered what really is the difference and I never really knew until actually quite recently, even though I've been doing both programming and, and coding. So programming is a multiple set of steps where you start by identifying the aspects of a real world problem that can be solved computationally. And then you go ahead and identify a computational solution for this. Then you start implementing the solution in a specific computer, uh, computer programming language, and then you test and validate. And the whole process is the programming part. The coding part is really just the implementing the solution in a specific computer language. 
And today's language is Python. So no, it's not um, a snake. Well, it's also a snake, but um, it's actually this. And the name stems from Monty Python rather than the Python itself. Um, Python is a general purpose programming language. Um, the interesting thing is the name refers both uh, to the programming lang language and the tool that executes the scripts in Python. Um, so why are we teaching you Python rather than say MATLAB or something um, or C++? Well, there's many different reasons. The first one is probably it's free. It has support for all operating systems. It's open source. It has a very large community, particularly for sort of data analysis problems. Um, it has a very rich ecosystem of third party packages. Um, and you can really get started doing nice and easily reproducible data analysis, much more so than what you would be able to do in, say, Excel. Um, it is an easy to learn language um, and it's easily shareable. Um, so in the next three days, we're basically just going to start sort of scratching the surface of what you can do with Python. And really, the idea is that you start exploring and take this as a sort of starting point of a gentle introduction um, of what you can do. And then I guess the next question is, what, what can you do after the, the workshop so that you don't lose momentum? Um, there are many different resources in terms of um, how you can learn Python. Um, obviously, this workshop is a good starting point. Um, then my favorite is literally just Google. And I will probably encourage you to try and Google some solutions even during, during the next few days as well, because that is basically what programming is. It's not like I just open up a terminal and then write a program. I get stuck after every three lines and I have to say, oh, how do I do this particular task in Python? What's the syntax? I don't remember. Um, I do a lot with Google Stack Overflow, particularly as a um, website you probably have come across because um, it has various advice on not just programming topics, but usually if you say, I don't know, I want to plot something in a specific way, someone else probably had exactly that same problem and posted that question on Stack Overflow and you can find your solution there. Um, then you have the Python package index or Anaconda, uh, which is what we're using, which is basically a package manager that allows you to install all of these wonderful tools other people have developed. And uh, if someone's done it well, they come with a good documentation. So you should be able to understand um, how, to, how to use that tool. Um, another good sort of starting guide is the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python. Um, and yeah, then just, I suppose, go and explore things. Um, so let's get started in terms of how do we run things in this workshop, um, at least for the next two days, is we're going to be using um, Anaconda. And in particular, part of that, we're going to be using JupyterLab. Um, so depending on how you install things, you may see a screen like this with lots of different things you can um, launch. My screen will look a little bit different. I'm going to start showing that in a second. But before we dive into actually getting started with uh, typing things out, I wanted to um, say a couple words about organization of data and um, content. Um, so Typically, what I would do is have a project folder. And in that project folder, I would have subfolders that would contain data and scripts and documents. Or maybe you can not call it scripts, but say Jupyter Notebooks. But basically, I'm trying to um, really have a systematic organization of my data. This is just an example. But um, 
Maybe you've all been there. I've definitely had the test 1.0, test 2.0, test final, test definitely final um, kind of data sets or documents. And in order to do, avoid that a little bit and to be sure what scripts should operate on what data, it's quite good to really pay a bit of attention to how you structure and organize your documents and data and kind of separate your data out from your scripts and always operate on the original raw data rather than having everything just kind of be converted as you go along what would happen in an excel spreadsheet when you when you analyze things um right so yeah, this is this is something I will briefly talk about. So um, there are different ways in running Python. So today and tomorrow, we're mostly going to be running it in this Jupyter Notebook environment, uh, which we will launch in a moment. But um, you can also run a Python um, Python interactively by just using your terminal. You type Python, and then you get this console. Um, indicated by these three um, arrows. And then you can just start typing your Python instructions. However, you don't really have a history of what, what you've typed out as in it is saved in the program and you do it step by step, but it might be quite difficult if you want to write a complicated analysis. So instead you can save it in a script uh, with the file extension .py and then that turns into a Python script um, and you can execute it again using Python myscript uh, dot py. This is something we're gonna look at probably on day three of how you can run your own script and how that might look. Um, for the next two days, we we're going to be using these um, Jupyter notebook cells, which are effectively interactive cells where you can start executing bits of Python script. And this is where we're going to now dive into um, actually getting started with this. Uh, so I am on a Mac. The way I launch my Jupyter lab is by just typing Jupyter lab um, in a terminal. So if you are on Windows, you can use your Anaconda prompt to type Jupyter Lab, or you might just be able to open up Jupyter Lab um, by using the search function in Windows. Um, I'll execute this, and what happens? It'll open up a new uh, Jupyter Lab window for me. I'm going to move that to a new window. Um, can everyone manage to get to this point where you have these options of um, a Python 3 notebook, a Python 3 console minimum? You might have other bits there as well, which I don't have. Um, if you could indicate some green... Um, thumbs or something like that, just to to make sure that everyone manage, manages to get to, to this point. Because if you don't, we're gonna have a little pause now to make sure everyone can, can reach this bit. Okay. Um, so I've created um, two directories, which one is called data and one um, uh, one is notebooks. So I will put all the notebooks in my notebook directory and all the data in, in the data directory. So you should hopefully also see this navigator here on, on the left. Um, you can create uh, a new directory by 
clicking this new folder button. So it might be now a good time for you to create your notebook folder and your data folder. I'm going to call. You can just rename it and I'm going to call this one documents. And then once you've created your data and notebook folders, um, I would like you to go to the plotting and programming and Python um, course material. I will put that link in the chat, provided I can find the chat. I can find the chat. Um, so if you click on that link, I've just posted in the chat. Um, you see that there's learners must get the gap minder data before class. You may have done this already, but I would quite like you to put that data set into the folder that is called data. And you'll have to do that on on your computer. So in my computer, I am now in downloads and I have this data folder here. I will now put that, oh, sorry about that. Oh, too many windows. Um, so I have this data folder in my downloads. I'm gonna just move that Actually, I'm going to delete this here. Can I move that just now like this? I don't think I can. That was very ambitious. I did not test this. Okay, so um, I'm just going to now move that folder into the bit where I'm doing the teaching. So uh, for me, that is documents, uni, teaching. You see my terrible directory structure. Um, Carpentries, March 2021, and I just move the data here. If you don't manage to move the data, leave it in downloads, that is also fine as long as you make a note as to where your data is, because we'll be using the data to analyze, um, to, to do some Excuse analysis. Me? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. I'm trying to create a folder, but it's not, nothing happened. Not allowed me to create a folder. Not allowed you to create a folder, but you have the yeah yeah I have that icon button, and then nothing happens or what? No, no, I have a lot of data listed down. I can share my screen. Mm, yes, please do. Participate in sharing. I think you have to stop sharing. Yes, I'll just make you um. Salim, is that yourself? Yeah. Let me just make you a co-host. How about that? Yeah. Share. So, can you see? Yes. Mm -hmm. I try to uh, create a folder, nothing happened. Can you scroll down? Do you see the big scrolly? Mm, no, um, up to the bit where you still have the directory, so a bit higher. Higher, 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 higher. Still going up, going up. Yes, maybe. Oh, start higher, higher. Carry on, carry on. Yep. Stop. Uh, if you go down a little bit. Up. Oh. Mm. Yeah, okay. So I guess you are 
um, your root directory is some in, in within your operating system quite buried um, deep down. So you might want to somehow try and navigate to a directory that is not your C directory, which is some mm -hmm. it looks like it's program files directory or something. Yeah, exactly. There is an arrow arrow up to go outside of this directory. So just below the kernel button in the menu, there is an arrow up, which might take you one level up from this directory where you are now. Um, um, just below kernel on up, the go up with your no, no, no one. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Oh no, no this is to upload. Wrong. That's the wrong one. <laughs> no, no cancel. Sorry, I'll stop talking. Let Tony do. Um, Maybe that's that little small arrow um, that you just hovered over. This one? Oh no, that's the no, sort. That's just the sorting. Yeah. yeah, and this is update uh, refresh. There is a folder option uh, to the left, a little folder, or yeah. There's um, some, something in the chat. Someone's had a similar problem. Oh yeah, yeah. I had the same thing. Mine opened in the Windows system directory. It's just a case of well, the way I solved it was just quitting Jupyter Lab and then um, opening a terminal, changing directory, and then reopening Jupyter Lab from a different directory. Yeah, that sounds like a quickest solution. I mean, but you can. So, can you click on the Jupyter notebook? Mm, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is a... So this is a system folder and it's not letting you create things in that system folder. So you have to start the Jupyter notebook from another folder that you have access to, maybe from your desktop or maybe from a folder that you created for this workshop. But, but I, I have a Python, can I use it? I already installed Python uh, separately. You install what? Python. Um, Python. Well, We'll be using Jupyter Notebook, so if you you can, um, I mean, it would be good if you could get a notebook to work. Maybe I could ask someone to go into a breakout room with you to get you set up because in the next sort of five yeah. minutes, we're just going to be talking yep. about a little bit of the how to use Jupyter. So I don't think you'll be missing too much. Okay. Okay, That's yeah, okay. let's do that. Yeah, okay. So I'll just create a, a room and send. Everyone else managed to get the data into a directory and is ready to go. So I have, um, like I'm able to launch different notebook, but I don't get the same user interface that you guys have. Interesting, can you share your screen? Yeah. Um, can I share my screen? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I can. Um, this is why I see you. That's perfect. That's totally fine. You just have a Jupyter notebook. What you will need to um, do is, do you see on your right, there's a new bit? Uh, on the right? Mm -hmm. uh, new here? Yep. Yeah. A uh, new Python, if you click on that. Okay. Um, probably want to do it in. Is that. Is oh, that, that, what, that? you can click on yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'll just rename that to something useful. Right. Again, this is where we'll, we'll end up eventually. So if you okay. manage to put your data directory into the day two of that in your computer, that'd be. Yeah, perfect. That's already okay. there. All right, cool. Wonderful. I just don't, I don't understand why, like, because you guys had like a, I don't know, like a fill tree structure on the left hand side, and then you had the Python things more in the center. So, so I don't know where that comes from. How how did you start? How did you start this? Just uh, that there. Yeah. So what you started is a Jupyter notebook. Okay. You, do you see how it says Jupyter notebook. So I can do the same. I'm gonna. Um, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, so I'm just going to close this. Um, so if I type 
Jupyter Notebook, what will happen is exactly what, what you've seen. So I, I'm, I'm just in my, um, I'm in this directory called Carpentries March 2021. Uh, and then I see my data documents and notebooks and, and the presentation. Um, if I type Jupyter Lab, I get the whole lab shebangs and I can launch a notebook by, by clicking on this and, and the navigating file structure. That is basically the the main difference between Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab, uh, but really for all the purposes we want to be doing today is we just want to work in a Jupyter Notebook. So it doesn't really matter whether you use Jupyter Lab or you just type Jupyter Notebook as long as in the end we have something that looks like this um, is is all that that matters. Um, Great, thank you. Cool. So I'm just going to, oh, I know I just unshared my screen. I'm just going to tidy my um, screen sharing a little bit so it's easier for you guys to see what's happening. <clears throat> Okay, so we now have an empty, so size-wise, can everyone see uh, and read what I'm sharing well? Great. I take that as a yes. Um, cool, so what are these? notebooks well effectively they let us execute python so i can now type python in here um and then it runs that bit of python code in the cell and and prints the output in this case we're just printing hello the way you run a cell is by not just using the return key, but using shift return, or you can use the run button up here um, that says run the selected cell and advance. Um, right. The nice thing about notebooks is that it has um, multiple modes. It has a command mode, and an edit mode. Um, so if you have the, the blue bar here, uh, that means you're in your edit mode. Um, if you're in command mode, it allows you to edit notebook le level features and edit mode allows you to change the content of a cell. Um, You can toggle between these modes. Oh, that was not what I wanted. Sorry about this. Uh, by going, so if you hit escape, it'll become gray. And if you hit enter or return, it, it'll become editable. If you're in command mode, you can use, for example, the key B and it'll create a new cell below. Um, you can use the key A and it'll create a new cell above. So let's put a um, print example cell. And if I'm now going into command mode, it will create a cell above or, be or below. Um, you can delete a current cell 
uh, using X. You can navigate with the arrows up and down. Um, can, sorry, um, Tony, can you just help Salim? So we, we are back into the main room. So he just needs to make sure that he has a, an empty notebook created. Yes, so absolutely. Salim, are you OK? Yeah, yeah. Do? OK, so you have something similar to what something Tony is showing. To what I'm showing? Mm -hmm. Yes, now I'm creating the, 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 the two folder, the notebook and the, the data, uh, data folder. Mm -hmm. And what next? Um, uh, well, and then as long as you have your, your notebook, so at the moment this is... Um, basically, um, notebook one, I'm going to call it and you see cells and if you type something like print hi into one of the cells and hit shift enter the python code written in it should be executed does that work for you that is i mean i have to start yeah okay yep yep yeah. And now I've just been going through the fact that you have a command mode and a edit mode. So if yeah, 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 yeah. it's blue, yeah. then you can edit it. And if you hit escape, then you can create a new cell below by using B and 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 basically move move about in the notebook. Um what is really nice is that you can mix something called Markdown and Python. So I know in theory, we're talking um, about Python today, but we're actually gonna start a little bit about uh, with uh, working with Markdown because that means you can really use your notebooks almost as a lab diary where you kind of run through your analysis with um, annotations. Um, so rather than just saying print hello, I can now give this notebook a heading um, by changing. So you have this button here where at the moment it says it's a code cell. We can change this to a markdown cell. And now I can use this language called markdown. If you just Google that, you'll find lots of information on it. Uh, but it's basically a bit like HTML, but a lot easier to write um, and read. That lets you um, uh, really structure your document. Um, so I can now put a heading. A heading is indicated by two um, hashtags um, and say, um, getting started with notebooks. So if I now hit shift enter, I have a heading. Um, I can create just rather than having a heading, I could say something like um, below is an example of how to print in Python. And that will just be a plain text. Um, what you can also do is use lists, uh, for example. So if I can change my markdown, uh, my code to markdown, I can now say um, my shopping for today is um, Blueberries, bananas, and apples. And now I create a list. Um, you can also have um, this is item one, this is item. Oh, 
you have a, a list that is numbered. Uh, you can create sublists. Um, you can create different headings. So the first one, I have a level two heading. You can add a few more hashtags and then you have uh, a smaller heading. And that way you can really break up your um, uh, your 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 notebook, and it also allows you to write um, scientific notation. So you can you can play around with with writing formulas, maths formulas, um, and really annotate your analysis. Um, what I would like you to do now is. Um, do a little bit of exercise yourself with this. Um, if we, uh, so we've been working on the first part of the running and quitting in, in Python, and I'm just gonna copy and paste that into the chat as well. If you go to the bottom of the document, um, you have um, a small set of exercises about creating a list, um, some math um, and changing uh, existing cells from uh, code to markdown and see what happens. Um, I would like you to spend sort of the next uh, five, 10 minutes to try these uh, exercises. If you have any questions while doing these, please ask. Uh, I'm just gonna very briefly disappear to get myself a glass of water and we'll be back with you uh, momentarily. Yeah, so I'll, throughout the day, I will also be using the markdown to annotate what we're, we're learning effectively.
How's everyone getting on? Good. Excellent. So if you're in edit mode, uh, in, in uh, sorry, in command mode, you can use the M key to change the cell to markdown. Um, and if you are in markdown mode, you can change it back, I think, using, oops. Uh, can't remember how to change it back to code. Does anyone know how to change it back to code? Uh, is it Y? Yes, Y, thank you, that's it. So you can go back to code using Y. All right, I'm gonna um, carry on now. If you haven't quite managed to do all of these exercises, don't worry too much about it. This is more sort of getting familiar with Markdown and um, the notebook environment, but really we're here to do some Python programming. So um, there's something you can revisit later and also just Google things if you are curious as to how, how this works uh, more and we'll sort of dive into the actual Python now. Um, so the, the main question um, we're gonna hopefully answer in the next 10 minutes is um, how can you store data in programs? Um, and I'm gonna use my, my lovely headings here uh, for this next part. And I'm gonna call it variables and assignments. And apologies for any typos I will definitely be making in the next uh, couple of hours. This is not the easiest to type and, and talk sometimes. So, Variables are essentially names for values. In Python, you use the equal symbol to assign a value to a variable. So I can say, for example, age equals 42. So the variable name is age and the assignment or the value assigned to it is 42. Um, I could also define um, a variable such as first name equals Susie. Um, and then uh, I now have two variables assigned age and, and first name. Variable names um, can only contain letters, digits, and underscores. So I could say um, uh, 
age 90, why ever I would like to do that, uh, is 10. This is a perfectly va uh, valid assignment, but I can't do something like 90 age. So my variable always needs to start with a letter uh, and not a digit. Um, the underscores, there are variables that start with an underscore, but um, that is something more of a special meaning in Python that we probably will not go into in variables, basically avoid um, starting a name with an underscore. Um, the other thing is variable names are case sensitive. So um, age equals 52 did not change the age of 42 to 52 because I now have a variable age with a small letter and I have a variable age with a capital letter. So how do we actually look at these variables? Um, well, the easiest thing is by just typing age and hitting shift enter, and then it'll just print that value. Um, that only works in a Jupyter notebook environment. If you put age into a script, um, um, if, you, if you have this in, in a script, nothing will be printed. So in order to print the information of a variable uh, to, to a screen, we can use the built-in function called print and it prints strings of text. So print um, gets highlighted in green because it is a built-in function. Uh, in order to call a function, I use uh, round brackets. Uh, and now I can actually just type um, a sentence First name is age years old. And what you see is, so Susie gets substituted for the variable name, the first name we've, which we've defined up here. Um, and then is age again gets substituted for the 42 we've define up here uh, years old. And then it automatically, by separating things with the commas, it automatically puts in the spaces for us, uh, which is quite neat. Um, it also automatically creates a new line at the end, which, which, is, um, which is useful. So another maybe fairly obvious concept, but um, something that is clearly needs to be mentioned is you need to actually define a variable before you can use it. So the computer can't just magically guess that if you define something as first name, you might also want to define something as second uh, name or last name. So if I try and print um, last name, nothing, will happen. And in fact, you get your first error, uh, which is last name is not defined. Um, what you've noticed is that variables persist between cells. Um, so the order of execution in a notebook is kind of essential. Uh, and you can get a little bit muddled with this. Um, so unless you run everything sequentially, it is, yeah, it is always a good practice to run things sequentially and not go and change things about because what I can now do is I can um, add a cell here and say uh, last name equals Paris. Um, and if I now execute this cell here at the bottom now, it will actually print the last name because I've since executed this cell, even though it wasn't executed before. Um, 
and and I now have access to it because essentially the, the kernel has remembered that information. Um, in order to make sure that you're actually uh, executing things sequentially and if you're a bit confused uh, of whether something is working or not, um, you can always use the restart kernel button um, and that basically resets your notebook to zero. Uh, if I now hit restart and I um, randomly execute this print last name uh, cell again, it will give me the same error because basically everything, all the variables that were previously held in memory are now gone. Um, and I will have to run each cell again in order to be able to access the information. So variables can be used in calculations. Um, let's uh, look at uh, calculations. Hi, Tony. Sorry, could you just remind me what's the what's the command for adding a new cell in the middle of ones that you've already written? Uh, so that that would be B or A. B would be for below, and A would be for above. Or oh, hang on, what, one second. I accidentally minimized my window, which is totally not what I wanted to do. Um, so the other thing you can do is just hit the plus button here. So you can just click on a cell and if you hit plus, then it will just create a cell below it. Okay, thank you. So calculations, I'm just gonna get rid of this. There's also the cut button, so you can just remove the cell uh, from here as well. So um, <clears throat> I can go and type something like age equals age plus three, and then print age in three years, age and it will add the three to my 42 I defined earlier. So we've not really talked about different types. We will do that in a little bit, but you have noticed that basically I can assign something like a string character to, to a variable. So I signify that using the quotation marks, but I can also assign um, um, I can assign um, number values to to my variables. Um, if I assign A string value, then I can actually do some really nice operations with uh, with these strings. So let's define uh, another variable called atom name, and say this is helium. So I can just print atom name again. That gives me the output helium, but I can also only print the first letter of this uh, by using indexing atom uh, name and for this I use square brackets and zero so in Python indexing starts at zero so in a lot of programming language you, you start counting from zero and that will return the the first character so in this case it will return um, the H. Um, if you wanted to uh, return the third character, you use the two. So you always need to be mindful of the fact that you start counting from zero rather than one. Um, what you can also do is um, get a whole sort of subsection of a word back. Um, and that is called slicing. Um, that would allow you to, to get a, a substring back. So um, 
the syntax for this is again using these square brackets and you would use something like um, start stop um, where your start index is um, maybe zero and then you stop at three. So if we put that together, say atom name zero two and there's a accidental bracket here it should print the first three uh, first two letters so um it doesn't include the end of the slice but it start it includes the start of the slice effectively um let's look at another example uh new atom equal sodium um, sodium and then we can print the first three uh, letters which is zero two three and use the colon to indicate the slice and uh, you get sod um, there's another built-in function. So we've talked about print. Print uh, is a function because it's highlighted in green and you know it's a function also because it uses these uh, round brackets uh, when calling something in it. Uh, another function that exists is um, length. So you might want to know something. Uh, yes, I'll get to the Python kernel in a little bit. I can do that. Um, so what length does is tell you the length of a string. Um, print len helium tells you, aha, there's six letters in helium. And um, just the len is this built-in function that allows you to um, to um, get your length back. Um, right, so the Python kernel is effectively your, your working memory or your Python brain that is currently running, um, particular, particularly in a notebook. So it basically stores all the executions and all the things you've, you've done um, in, in an accessible memory way. So you can always go back. If you've executed a cell, you have all that information um, saved in there. It's, it's basically um, a current, current snapshot of all the steps you've, you've taken in, in your Python notebook. Um, and sometimes you want to do many, many steps. I mean, at the moment, we're just printing names, but you might have quite a complicated analysis. Um, and you would like to troubleshoot why something isn't working. So you want to isolate the problem. You might only want to run a section of it. Um, and basically in order to refresh your memory or to reset the kernel to a working state where things haven't gone funny is, is when you kind of want to restart it um, <clears throat> in order to yeah, kind of get, get going again. Um, I think we'll probably encounter an example where we might want to restart the kernel uh, later to kind of illustrate why, why this is helpful. <clears throat> so I think the last um, point I would like to make, it's very important to use meaningful variable names. Um, because I can do something like bemu bemui equals forty two. Um, Garminto equals Ahmad, and then I can do a print of bemi. Oh, sorry. Uh, Garamento is 
uh, baby years old. So this is exactly the same example as we had before. Ahmad is 42 years old. However, if I now read that print statement, I have no idea what Garminto and Baby might be. So they're completely meaningless. Uh, whereas if I use something like age and last name or first name, it's much easier to understand. And particularly if I were to share my code with someone, uh, they can have a look at it and have a guess as to what the variable Baimi stores, because if it's called age, then it's likely to be an age of something. Um, so with this, I would like to use the next um, seven minutes for you to have a look at the exercises. Uh, don't worry if you don't get through all of them, because I would then kind of seamlessly go into the coffee break. Um, I will make the announcement when we actually start on the coffee break because I would encourage you to move away from your screen and kind of move your shoulders a little bit um, in that coffee break. But up to that point, um, I will copy and paste the link to the exercises and <clears throat> open them up here as well. So we've just gone through the variables and assignments part and at the bottom here, you have um, exercises on swapping values, predicting values, um, challenge, choosing a name. So have a look at them. Um, in fact, I would probably encourage you to um, skip over the swapping values bit because that is a formatting exercise more than anything. And I think some of the other ones are a bit more interesting uh, to look at. Um, so yeah, and if you have any questions, please let me know. How much time um, do they have for the exercises? So, so I think we're basically we're running into the coffee break. So I'll make a announcement saying we'll start coffee break in six minutes, five minutes. Okay, good.
All right, um, it is now time to have a little break from the computer and um, make a tea or coffee or a glass of water or just kind of stand up and uh, walk around a little bit. And we will resume at 10.30. Do you want to show the slide um, or do you want me to do it? Well, if you have... Um, uh, 10 30. I'll yeah. just do it. Cool, thank you. Cheers. I'll just show my screen.
All right, um, welcome back from your coffee break. Um, I'm going to give you another sort of two, three minutes to return back and maybe finish off the exercise before moving forward. Also, if for some reason you don't manage to finish the exercises in the time we allocated, that is nothing to worry about. I think the exercises are quite um, substantial sometimes, so it can take more than what the suggested uh, time is, but sometimes it can also be a lot faster. So. Um, they do provide all the solutions. And if at any point you want to have something clarified, please just ask effectively. Can I just get a quick sort of ticks or thumbs that everyone's happy to continue? Great, fantastic, wonderful. All right, so as we kind of briefly, or I already briefly mentioned is that variables can have different types. So the next 10, 15 minutes, we're gonna look at what types there are and how you convert between them um, and how it might be a little bit misleading that you can just say variable name equals something and you don't explicitly set a type, but that type is still still there and how, how to find out what, what type um, we're actually using. So I'm just gonna create another heading uh, types and type conversions is the next topic. So every value, even if it doesn't have an in, uh, integer, uh, even if it doesn't have a variable name assigned to it or something, everything we type in Python has a type. And there are effectively three different types. Um, so you have an integer type, which represents positive and negative whole numbers. So it'd be three, 10, minus 200, something like that. Um, then you have floating point numbers, which represent real numbers. So anything with a floating point, um, say 2.5 or uh, minus 3.7 and so forth. And then the last type um, are strings um, and they're effectively text. Um, and you indicate those with a single or a double quotation mark. So what we've um, seen before is basically me using a random mixture of quotation marks. So uh, name Susie and name Lara are both perfectly valid strings. But if I do something like name, I'll well, see my, the, 
it doesn't even let me do this. Um, Phil, it will complain saying that I'm not using the same um, type of quotation mark. So as long as you use both single quotation marks or both double quotation marks, these are perfectly valid ways of defining a string. Um, so how do we actually figure out what kind of type a variable is? Uh, and for this, there's this lovely built-in function called type. So we can use this with a nested way of calling the print function type. Again, as you can see, it highlights in green. So it tells us that is a built-in function. And if I say type 42, it will return the fact that it's an integer. The class bit, don't worry about that at the moment. That um, is a bit more advanced sort of Python specific um, language topics, but the, the the main part is the the int, which signifies it's an integer. Um, Say so we can do the same thing with defining a variable. So fitness equals average, and then print type fitness will tell us that it's of type string because I used my um, string quotation mark uh, to signify that I would like it to be a string. Um, types really control uh, what operations can be performed on them. So I can subtract integers, no problem. I can do something like print three minus five and it will tell me that it's minus two. Um, but if I say something like print hello minus H, it will uh, tell me that this is the operand minus is not supported for string and string. Uh, what you can do is use the plus and multiplication operator on strings. So um, we can say something like full uh, name equals um, David plus space plus mm, Owen. And then if I print this, uh, it will print me the entire string. So I can add individual strings to, to make a bigger string. Um, I can also use the multiplication character. So for example, if I wanted to separate um, text out, uh, separate out text in, in a meaningful way, I could define something like a separator um, equals the equal sign times 10. So what this does is take the single equals string character and multiplies it by 10. Um, and assigns it to the variable separator. So if I now print separator, I get 10, uh, 10 times my equal sign printed effectively. Um, strings have a length. We've already seen that um, from when, when we were looking at uh, helium, uh, the atom names last time, uh, uh, well, earlier. So you can say print len of last name gives me the length six, um, or let's say full name, uh, that gives me the length 10. Um, but if I were to do something like print <clears throat> len 52, um, the object of type int has no length. 
if you want to operate on strings and integer numbers at the same time, you need to be able to convert between them. So you can't say something like print one plus two. Um, it tells you there's unsupported operand types plus for int and string. So, so why, why might this be? Well, it's ambiguous, right? So if I say print, well, the computer doesn't know what to do with it because you could say print one plus two as in the numbers, one plus two, that makes three, but you could also mean print one plus two, which in fact makes it 12 or a string that contains one and two. Um, so for the computer, it's not clear what you're trying to tell it. So you really need to explicitly say, actually, I want you to do the integer addition, or I want you to um, take two strings and make a bigger string out of these two individual strings. In order, so the way you convert them is by saying one plus uh, plus int of two, and that will take the string version of the two and convert it to an integer, and you should get the same output as uh, in cell thirty two. And if I do the same thing for print. Um, string of one plus two, I should get the same output as in, in 33. And I do. Um, you can mix integers and floats uh, freely in operations. Um, if you had been an old Python 2 person, then this was a bit trickier, but in, in Python 3, which is now the the standard Python everyone is using, um, you can say something like half is one divided by 2.0. So now we have an integer divided by a float and it will give us a float back. Um, I could also use the um, to the power operator. So uh, three squared is um, three to the power of two. I can do this, but I could also say 3.0 to the power of two. And what I get at the end is either an integer or a uh, float. Um, variables um, can only really change value when something is assigned to them. So this is different to say Excel. So you always need to re reassign something for, for it to change its value. Mm. Let's take a look at the following example. First equals one. Uh, second equals five times first. And first equals two. What should second print if I print these out at this point? Um, first is first and second is second. So let's walk this through. So first is one, one times five is five. So second is five at this point, and then first equals two. So if this was a Excel spreadsheet, second would automatically update because I've reassigned first but in Python, this isn't the case. So first is two, but second is 
still five times one what what the first was here. So this is exactly um, what the printout tells us. So fir first is updated to two, but the second is not 10. It's still one times five. Um, and yeah, that kind of uh, brings us to the exercise part of, of this section. So again, um, I will copy this into the chat. And if you go to the bottom, then um, you have a bunch of questions around fractions, atomic type conversion, chooser type and division. So you'll have until um, 10.55 to, to have a go at these. And feel free to ask um, Uh, to, to ask any questions while while going through these. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask here.
Does anyone have any questions or is everyone getting on okay? Till now it's okay. Cool. Um, in that case, I might uh, carry on. And again, don't worry if you've not done all the exercises. So the next bit we are going to talk about is built-in functions. Uh, we've already encountered some of them um but now we're gonna like conceptualize this a little bit more um so that is the next sort of bigger subheading i think um before i dive into that just a sort of note on the side so i've obviously been using some of the markdown language to comment and kind of try and structure this document a little bit. Um, what you can do if you write a Python script, you can also use comments within that. And in fact, it is highly recommended to comment your code well, even if you're only writing it for yourself. Uh, future you will be very happy with past you if you've commented it well and actually understand what's going on rather than uh, if you've given all your variable names really weird names you don't understand anymore and you have no idea what the program is actually doing. So it's really a good practice to get into the habit of commenting everything you write as you write it rather than like, oh yes, I'll get back to commenting that later, you never do. And um, yeah, I've, I've definitely, had much more fun going back to things I've commented than things I haven't commented. And I've definitely been on the on on the part where I have no idea what a program did anymore because I was too lazy to comment it. So in Python, how do you write comments? Uh, you can use the hash symbol. Uh, this is a comment. Uh, comment. Uh, then I can type something like adjustment equals 0 0.5 or 0 0.5. Um, this is also a comment about what this variable, it, variable is about, for example. So if I execute this, all of these bits get ignored and all the program does is um, assign 0 0.5 to adjustment. Um, so functions, um, yeah, let's, uh, I don't really know why, why this is a general good comment about comments. Let's go back to the functions. So um, fun, uh, 
functions may take zero or more arguments. And this is kind of what we've been doing already. So when we type print we, um, and say, hi, we're giving print the argument, hi. Uh, we can also give print no argument and just say print um, and then say something like hi again. Um, and what you see here that if you give print no argument, it will print an empty line effectively. Um, different functions will have different requirements. Um, some functions um, may have to have an argument. Other functions like print are perfectly fine to not have an argument. Um, however, every function will produce some kind of result. Um, I mean, the obvious result for print is that you see something printed to the screen, but you could also take the result and actually um, assign it to a variable. So we could say something like result equals print hi. Uh, whoops. And then we could go and print the result again. Um, result of print is result. Um, and what you see is that it doesn't print, it doesn't take high as the result, but it actually tells you that it's none. Um, and none is a Python object that stands uh, in any time when there is no value effectively. So um, often a function might return a, if something's gone wrong, um, or you might want, you might have a, a certain thing you want to return. So if you look at length, for example, the return is the length of, of your, your string. Um, whereas for print, you're just printing to your screen, uh, but you're not necessarily um, wanting to return a, a value from, from that function. Um, There are a bunch of other commonly used built-in functions. So we've kind of encountered print and length. Um, a typical other one is max. One, two, three. So that just tells you what is the maximum of a list of things you put in there. Um, you could do something similar with min. So that tells you the minimum of um, what is in a list of things. And you can see that you can also use strings to do this with. So it doesn't have to be numbers. Um, and the way strings work is that um, they're effectively ordered. So um, you order your, your strings from zero to nine, and then you have your capital letters from A to Z, and then you have your small letters from A to Z. And that's how you end up with um, the smallest in, in, in this example being zero. Um, functions in general will require a certain type of argument or combination of arguments. So you can't just randomly put lots of things in there. So if I, if I say something like print um, oh, sorry, print was a bad example. So obviously print will just print the, the values with your space put in there, but say I say print max uh, of one and a, 
um, again, we have this thing where we're mixing a string and a integer. So I cannot compare strings and integers. So the, the computer again, or the Python interpreter does not know which is larger. Is it the string or, or the one? Whereas if I say this is also a string, then it will tell me that A is larger just based on, on the way um, the, the strings are organized in, in Python. So functions may have different values uh, for some arguments. So um, for example, if I use the function round, that will round a floating point. So 3.7545 will give me four because it rounds up to the next integer which would be four. However, what if we want to round to more decimal points, we can actually give round a second argument. So 3.7535 comma one will now round to one point after the decimal and, and, and look at this five here and then round up uh, to to the nearest um, uh, decimal here. So how do you know what you find in your function? Because at the moment I've just been randomly using these things and I was like, how on earth can you find out what kind of arguments a function takes? And this is again, actually kind of where the commenting ties in. So if at some point later on, we'll be writing our own functions, it is super helpful to have a comment because the comment can then be used with the built-in help functionality. So I can access the help in different ways. In a Jupyter notebook, I can open up the brackets and then hit shift tab and it will uh, pop up this nice, um, helpful information about the function. So in this case, round uh, takes a number and then n digits equals none. So the none means that I don't need to necessarily provide that information, but if I do give it n digits as an argument, it will take that to round to that number of digits. And then the return value is an integer if digits is omitted or none. Otherwise the return value has the same type as the number n digits may be negative. So this kind of gives you information of what what you can put there. Um, you can also access this uh, information differently. So you can uh, use another built-in function help uh, and then give the name of the function and it will print out the same information into your output of your cell. Um, which makes it yeah, very, very nice and easy to kind of see um, what is actually possible um, with the functions you're working with. Um, so let's have a look at another one of these functions. So print um, actually takes a bunch of other arguments we haven't really looked at. Um, but that kind of gives you an idea why, for example, if I print one comma two, it puts a space between the one and two because actually there's a default defined called separator equals one empty space. So I could change that and say one comma two comma set equals comma and I now print one comma two and I've basically overwritten the default of of the print function putting a, a blank space between the the bits uh, you might want to print um 
Um, so I think we've encountered this before, but um, program, well, Python is quite good at um, giving you information about syntax errors and kind of highlighting when you've made a mistake, when you've written something. Um, so I think I've shown this before that if you use a bad way of, of naming a string, um, it will tell you what is wrong. So there's an end of line um, error while passing a string, and then it'll point with a little up arrow here at the point where there's an issue with your code. And then hopefully that will uh, allow you to identify where you've made a mistake and, and fix that. Um, you might get other types of errors such as, um, say you accidentally said age equals equals 52 because you kind of didn't notice that you already put the first equal sign. Again, it will just highlight that there's some invalid syntax and it'll point at the bit where the issue is. Um, another typical one, which is far more likely to happen if you write a script rather than in a notebook, is you might forget um, a bracket. So print um, hi. If I type it like this uh, in my notebook, the close bracket gets automatically closed. So I think forgetting to close that is very unlikely, but if you type in, in a different editor, uh, you might have that problem. So actually for me, this is a good way of advertising either using notebooks uh, to, um, to write Python or use a editor such as Atom or Sublime or PyCharm that will actually do a lot of sort of opening and closing of brackets and opening and closing of quotation marks automatically for you. So you can avoid um, syntax errors like this because yeah, it's quite easy to forget a closed bracket or a, a closed quotation mark sign. Um, so this is great. We've, we, we're getting lots of errors from poor syntax uh, and, and things where we're, we're doing wrong. Um, what if something goes wrong when we execute um, a bit of a script. So we had this example where we say age equals 53 and then age um, in three years equals age plus uh, age plus three. So the eagle-eyed person has already spotted that I've mistyped age, but having a typo in, in, in your variable names is quite common, particularly if they become long and descriptive, which is helpful for you understanding what, what you're writing. But um, I don't know, my, my typing isn't, isn't the best. And then you do get a nice little error from Python telling you, huh? I don't know what to do with uh, age because it is a variable that you have not defined. So I can't actually do anything with that. Um, and yeah, that again kind of um, will point at a line where the issue is. And then hopefully you as an eagle eyed person will notice that, oh yes, I misspelled my variable name. Um, and then you can fix it. And Python kind of helps you try and find these issues for you. Um, yeah, so with that, we can have a look at the exercise section of, of the built-in in functions part of the exercises. So I'm just gonna... Uh, Copy that into the chat. Um, and I would 
restart in five minutes. So have a look at them and, and see if they make sense and feel free as per usual to ask any questions. Hey, um, I've got a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is one of the examples they give, and I've just pasted that into the chat there. Uh -huh. um, seeing the very final version, I understand like, what it's doing. It's doing the length on the variable of my string. But uh -huh. why has it got the underscores either side of it? Why, why is that necessary? Um, so this is, this is a special a function that is attributed to the class string. Uh, and this is something we don't really um, teach here, I suppose. Um, so you, you have all of these special functions that um, have underscores um, and yeah, so the the class string has um, a bunch of built in essential functions that need to be implemented for this class and um, that is signified effectively by these underscores and typically you wouldn't want to call these kind of functions because um, they're kind of hidden from the user um, and are meant to be operated, not operated on by, by the user effectively. Um, 
you can define a function like that yourself, but um, I don't know if you've if you're familiar with other types of programming languages. Um, I suppose uh, if you've come across private variables, then this would be a private method in a class or a private function. All right. Okay, that makes a lot of sense actually. But um, yeah, because in Python you don't have public and private, um, so yeah. one way of hiding it is through the underscores. So you make okay. sure you don't overwrite the function by writing the function with the same name, basically. Yeah. So there. Oh yeah, because kind, of, in, in kind Python, of hidden. In Python, I can do something like print equals um, forty-two, and then if I type print, then it's forty-two, and print will no longer work because I've overwritten my function 42. And this is a good example of when you might want to use your restart kernel button. Um, Cheers, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. So for the example, which is um, the maximum of two strings of text, mm -hmm. does it just compare the first characters? What, how does it how does it do it? For the, it's got golden tin. It's working at the maximum of the these two strings, and it decides it's tin. Is that because T is after G, or, or does it somehow compare more things in the word? As far as I know, is T after G, and that's why it says that. Thank you. All right, before the next coffee break, um, I'm going to introduce um, the concept of libraries and libraries are super useful also for the example that's just come up in terms of overwriting certain functionalities. Um, so if you want to create user specific um, functionality, so I don't know, you, you want to do a certain type of analysis over and over again, and you have certain types of data, then you might write um, something called a library to do that for yourself. And um, in order to not accidentally say overwrite existing Python functionalities, libraries allow you to effectively use similar names um, without accidentally overwriting say a print function or a length function or, or something something like that because I can um, define a different type of length or a different type of print in in my library um, we're probably well we're in fact we're not going to do that but we're going to look at how you can use libraries um, in a very simple and easy way to start with. And then we're gonna use a bunch of libraries uh, later for, for the data analysis. So effectively, a library is a collection of files. Um, they're called modules. And um, these files contain functions um, that can be used uh, by other programs. Um, they can contain data values. Uh, they can contain um, yeah, functions and just generally related things that might be useful for that purpose of the library. Uh, Python has a standard library uh, that is quite extensive and it comes with Python itself. Um, so you can just look up 
the Python standard library, so things like print and length are in there. Um, and then you have this Python package index, or you have Conda, which basically allows you to write your own library and make that available to other people um, to use. Um, generally, in order to use a library, you uh, follow a certain type of syntax. So you can uh, load a library model module using the word import. So we can type something like import math. Um, and math is a library that uh, provides you with a bunch of functionality around uh, maths, unsurprisingly. Um, and I can type something like import math, and then I have access to uh, parts of math. For example, uh, pi, Ooh. pi is math dot pi. So pi is a value that has been stored in this library. Um, <clears throat> You can also import specific aspects um, of a library. So I could say um, from math um, import cos. And now I can use the function cos on math.py. Um, I'm going to print that. Whereas before, if I wanted to use cos, I would have to, um, I'm just going to restart the kernel and import math and try and uh, run the cos math.py thing again. Uh, cos is not defined because it is part of the math library, but um, I haven't specifically asked to import it. So in order to use it um, without using this from math import cause part, uh, I would have to use it in this way where type math dot cause is uh, math dot pi. But obviously that kind of gets a little bit lengthy. So um, you can also set aliases. Um, uh, you might be able to, uh, yeah, to, so in order to set an alias, you can say um, import math as M. So rather than having to now type math dot something, I can say print math, whoop, math, no, that was the whole point of not having to type this, M dot cos and uh, M dot pi. And uh, that way you can shorten things or you can use this shortcut from here where you say from math import cos and you could even say comma pi and then you can just say print cos of pi. Um, but then you sometimes it's useful to not forget where certain functionality comes from. If you use this math m dot, at least you remember that these are part of the math library rather than something you've defined elsewhere um, yourself. Um, so a library obviously has a lot of information. Again, documentation is super helpful there. If you're writing your own library, you want to document it well. If someone else has written a library, hopefully they've documented it well. So you can, again, use the help functionality to have a little bit uh, of a look in terms of what the library does. So help math um, tells you, aha, uh, this is the name of the module. It's called math. Math is documentation that was automatically generated and kind of gives you information on uh, um, that module. It gives you a really convenient uh, Python link. So in fact, if you don't wanna look at the documentation, um, 
in your Jupyter notebook in, in this kind of weird way, you can just go to the documentation link and it tells you all the different uh, functionalities uh, math has. So yeah, you can see there's a floor uh, function, there's a sum function, I don't know. And it gives you all the, the information what, what, what these different um, things do uh, with sometimes examples, which can be quite helpful. Um, yeah, so with that, um, you can have a look at the um, exercises in, in the library section of the documentation again, um, just pasting it into the chat. Um, and yeah, then effectively we're going into our coffee break. So I'm gonna suggest we're gonna take the 15 minute break um, and then start having a, a look at the uh, math module exercises for like five, 10 minutes. Um, but we'll reconvene at quarter to 12. I'll make a slide and then um, let me know when you want me to show the slide on the screen, Tommy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you if you show it now, I think we can go into the break and then just have another five minutes after the break to take a look at the exercises. Sure. Okay. Shall I stop your screen sharing? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I can do that um, as well. Stop sharing. No, it's okay. I'll done it. I see there's an interesting discussion um, happening in the chat around um, variable inspection. So I will second what people have been saying. I tend to use PyCharm for um, proper coding. I, I use a lot of Jupyter notebooks for prototyping things and for plotting because once we get to the plotting part, you really get really nice inline plots and uh, you can really tell a visual story. But if you want to write complicated analysis, um, then yeah, using an IDE might be better. Um, there's a community edition uh, for PyCharm, I think. As well. I know, but you can get the free one though. You get all the nice fancy stuff and you don't pay for it. Oh, does the community edition not have all the the stuff? I, I've had some like niggling little things for the past. Okay. If you're in if you're in academia, it's free. You might as well get the free one, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. If anyone's doing JavaScript, WebStorm also from JetBrain is really good IDE for JavaScript. Um, but it's not free. <laughs> there is also RubyMine from JetBrains for Ruby development. So they have all sorts of yeah. a suite of tools for different programming languages. But, but no, the entire JetBrains suite is free for all. Like if you just give them a, a, like an academic address. And, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, like a, if, you, if you get bounced back from it, you might need to, of course, speak to your uh, local institutes, technical you know, software, whoever it mm -hmm. is. Uh, it's definitely cleared for IS and it should be cleared <clears throat> for you guys in Manchester if I, you know if the people I spoke to in Manchester uh, are telling the truth. Interesting. Good to know. Mm.
Right, so I um, hope you've got a bit of a feel um, for what a library is and how you might interact with it a little bit now. Um, we'll be using a new library over the next hour and finally start doing some data analysis with that library. Um, so I'm going to get rid of the help math printout because it's long and we don't need it. Um, and instead, give it a nice little heading. Modular data. So how can you read in tabular data? I, I assume that a lot of you would be working with um, some kind of tabular data. Um, maybe you have been scripting in MATLAB or something else already. Maybe you've just been using Excel, um, but effectively I'm gonna introduce you to a library called Pandas now, which is kind of the library to deal with tabular data and it's kind of the Excel of Python effectively. Um, so yeah, the library is called Pandas and it is really good to do statistical analysis uh, on tabular data. Um, <clears throat> it is kind of similar to data frames in R. If you have come across that, I'm personally never really used R very much, so I can't comment massively on this, but this is what I'm told. Um, and yeah, it's quite straightforward to read in data and manipulate data. So let's get started with that. So um, as before, we're gonna use an alias to actually import it. So that was the as notation. Um, I can type import pandas as pd. Uh, you will find that in the Python community, there are certain sort of import standards people um, have started using. So pandas is often imported as pd. Um, you will encounter maybe a library called numpy that is often imported. Excuse as me, could you share your screen? Oh, shit. Yes, I'm so sorry. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thank you for pointing that out. Um, I mean, to be fair, I've not really typed very much yet. I've just been talking mostly. Um, so what I've been typing is import pandas as PD. I hopefully you can see that now. Um, my apologies. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so yeah, you will encounter very typical, oh, no module called pandas. Well, um, yes. I can fix this. Can you all try and import pandas uh, and see whether you manage to do that? Can, I, can everyone import pandas or is it, is it just me? I get the same error code as you. The same error. Okay. So the way I fix this, I'm going to change the way I share my screen. Um, if you have an anaconda prompt, open, you can um, type something called conda install pandas. And then something like this should pop up and you should be able to just say yes and install it. So let's try and help people. So people on the windows, they should be able to find an Aconda prompt I think from their Windows run prompt, if they type Anaconda prompt, you might get um, a window like this. Yeah. And for people on Macs and 
Linux laptops. The terminal. You should just you should just be able to do it from your yes from your shell. So the can you just repeat the command to type once again? So it's conda install conda install install pandas. If you if the import doesn't work for you. Okay, so now is the time to shout if you can't find an Aconda prompt for Windows users <laughs> yeah. or if this is not working. So what I will need for to you. do now is restart my kernel because I installed a new library. So this is another good reason to restart the kernel. Um, and hopefully now I should be able to import this and I can um, because I've now managed to install uh, pandas. Can everyone get to the import pandas as PD part now, or are you still fixing things? I see lots of thumbs up. Yeah. Great. Not sure who had the problem, but did you manage to do the install? It was me and uh, yeah, the cool. basic gave work for me. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. It's work without installing or me wonder. Yeah, so I think for most of you it should work because you would have installed Anaconda. The, the way I've set up my environment is a bit specific and I forgot that I needed to separately install it. Um, so for most of you, this should have been fine. Um, but it's good to know how to install other packages that, that don't come with yeah. the Anaconda Python distribution. So you might find yourselves needing to install packages like this. So you might actually have to go to Anaconda prompt and install new packages and libraries and then import them in your notebooks or Python scripts. So you can even import, uh, like install things actually in your notebook. So I could type something like Conda install matplotlib, which is a plotting library, minus minus yes, and then execute that within my uh, notebook. And it will install things. So the, the exclamation mark here basically means I'm running a shell command rather than a Python command. Um, and the minus minus yes is needed because usually it requires you to interactively accept uh, your install, which you can't do in, in your um, Python cell here or your Jupyter notebook cell. Um, but yeah, so that is one way of installing um, even within the notebook. So just a quick question. If you do it from, from a Jupyter notebook, if you install a package mm -hmm. from a Jupyter notebook, is that installing it for your whole system or is that just for the current kernel? Just for the, cur for the current environment you're in. Okay. So if you do it from your Jupyter notebook, next time you come to a, a different notebook, you would you still wouldn't have Matplotlib installed on your system. So that's possibly no, no, one. No, or would you have it? So it, it installs install. it on a system. It installs it. So, okay, I guess what I do is I use environments and we've not really discussed environments. So it installs it in the current environment you're running your kernel in. Um, but also, again, you need to restart your kernel to actually activate this because effectively what that command does is take, like it, it is exactly the same thing as what I did in the shell here. Um, so maybe I, the recommend, recommended way might be actually to just do things like this from, from the shell. Yeah. But yeah. it's possible to do it from the Jupyter lab. I think, I think well. the issue is that there's many, so you can also, um, Um, hang on, how do I? Uh, so if I open up a new launcher, I could even go to a, oh no, it's Python console, hang on, that's not what I wanted. Uh, file new 
launcher. I can also get a terminal within um, my uh, JupyterLab environment. So I think there's lots of different ways to effectively do the same thing. So it can be a little bit confusing. Um, maybe I'm just now confusing everyone. I'm sorry, this probably is not super helpful. Let's go back to pandas. So different ways to do the same thing, yeah, <laughs> basically. Basically, you'll find in Python, there's a lot of ways uh, in doing the same thing and uh, kind of understanding which might be the best way for the question you have uh, is requires a little bit of practice and time effectively. Uh, so I remember when I started out with Python, uh, all I wanted to do was read in a file and I was kind of uh, given five different options. And I was like, I have no idea which option is the right option for my particular problem. Um, and ended up writing lots and lots of code that, well, that was definitely not necessary just because I didn't know which of the options I was presented was was the best solution for for my uh, for my issue. And I think this is something that is quite normal when you start out with uh, programming and just by practice, you, you get better. Uh, but speaking of reading files, we are going to now try and read in that um, gap minder data we downloaded earlier. So hopefully you <clears throat> have put it into a directory called data. In my case, um, so reading in um, a CSV file or like a tabular data file, comma separated variable file uh, with pandas is quite straightforward. You assign the read in data to a variable name data and that will become a so-called data frame. And then um, PD for using the alias for pandas uh, read CSV. And then you just give it the file path. In my case, this is um, going up one directory, going to data, and then uh, going to Gapminder um, Oceana. So the way I get up, get that um, drop down prompt here, I just use tab in order to get suggestions of what data is available. And I'm using GDP Oceania uh, data set to start out with. And then I just hit uh, shift return. Oh, QD is not defined, okay. And I have now successfully read in the data. I can look at what is in it by saying something like print data, uh, which gives it in a not super nice formatting, or I can just type data and it actually kind of prints it in this nice sort of tabular format. And you have um, two countries, which is Australia and New Zealand, and then the GDP per capita for different years. So 52, 57, and so forth, all the way up to 2007. Um, can everyone manage to read in this Gapminder GDP Oceania data set? Uh, bearing in mind that you might need to change the path to where it is on your computer. Hi, is there an easy way we can find out what folder the, um, the notebook will be running in? Um, you, can, you can type uh, PWD and that would tell it for me. I'm not sure if that works on Windows. Um, oh no, I'm on a Mac anyway, so that, and that's okay. what. Great, thank you. Yeah. So if you're having problems with this, now would be the best time to speak up so you can follow along with the data set. No issues, everyone's happy. Great. 
Okay, well, I will carry on in that case. Um, please do speak up if you uh, are having issues. <clears throat> so at the moment we have read in this data set and we have um, this index row where it basically just says zero and one. It might be quite useful to have um, the country as an index row instead, uh, which you can um, do by passing a um, index column uh, parameter to the read CSV function. So rather than reading the data set uh, like I did up here, I could read it in in this way where I say PD dot read uh, CSV and then data gapminder Oceana. So same as before, but now I say I want want my index column <clears throat> to equal country and the way I know what that is, is basically the, the heading of, of um, that particular column in my, in my file. So now, uh, sorry, index col, I, I, so, okay. So I've got an error now. Um, how do I know what went wrong? Well, the best way is to look at the documentation of my read CSV. And then I will realize that I've made a typo that in fact it's index underscore col and not column. So I just type too many words and uh, too many letters. And now I don't have this zero one indices anymore, but I have Australia and New Zealand as my sort of index. Um, columns. Um, so data is a so-called data frame and that comes with some useful associated uh, methods. Uh, so data.info will give you some information of what is actually stored in it. So it's a data frame. So this is kind of a bit similar to when we looked at the type, when it says class uh, type int. So now we have this pandas core frame data frame. Uh, then it tells us that we have two entries, uh, which is Australia to New Zealand. So these are uh, the rows. Um, and then you have uh, 11 column headings, and it tells you that the data type is um, float 64. And uh, in total, it uses 208 bytes of memory. <clears throat> so we can also look at um, information stored in, in the columns of the data frame. Um, this can be done by saying data dot columns. And that gives you the, it gives you an, an array, which we haven't really quite discussed what they are yet, but basically gives you a list of um, headers of the columns. So basically the names of each column header in, in a list. And this is a bit similar to when we did math.py. Um, so it kind of gives you um, not a method or like a function here where you have the info with the, the round brackets. You have no brackets after column. It basically tells you this is something called a member variable. And math.py would have also been a member variable um, or just a member of, of that um, particular class, which is of type data frame. Um, 
you can um, transpose a data frame. So if you would like the columns to be rows and the rows to be columns, um, you can um, do something like data.t, where t in maths would be quite often used for a transpose. And now you have uh, your two countries as your columns and all your um, years uh, per capita data years as your rows. Mm. <clears throat> Another useful um, tool is uh, the built-in function for data frames uh, describe that kind of provides you with summary statistics um, of only the columns that have numerical data. So it basically um, is quite good at ignoring non-numerical data. In our case, we only have numerical data, so it'll give us um, statistics about everything. So I can print out data dot describe and that will tell me what is the mean GDP in the year 1952. I have a count of two, um, standard deviation, the minimum, and then the 25th, 50th, or 75th percentile, and the maximum. Obviously, with two data points, this is not massively meaningful, but if you have um, a lot of information, then um, you get really nice sort of instant statistics on, on your data frame. Um, yeah, so now if we turn to the exercise, you kind of get to play with the Gapminder America's data set that has a bit more data in it than just um, your New Zealand and Australia two countries and um, have a have a little play with that. I will share the link again in the chat. Well, I can find the chat. So yeah, if you scroll down to reading other data exercise, you can now do the same thing with the um, with another data set and kind of see how that goes. Um, we'll restart in sort of five minutes again. Hi, Antonia, uh, it's Joya. I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm about this last uh, function. In case we have uh, strings instead of numbers within the data frame, how can we adapt the describe function to, to, to strings rather than to numbers, to integers? So it wouldn't, so it'll just ignore all the strings. So it'll only collate statistics on numerical data you've got. Okay. Um, if you wanted to include strings and the strings are, so, so, so the, the nice thing about pandas, uh, it will automatically read in numbers as numbers and not read them in the strings. So unless you explicitly put quotation marks in, it, it will just read numbers in. Um, you can also use the same kind of functionality we've used earlier that you can take a string and can convert it into a number if if it is of some kind of numerical value. I mean, if it's um, a word, then you, you probably don't want to try and convert it because you can't. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll look at how I think we're we're looking at how you can change types data types in in your data frame. But you can basically also manipulate the data type in your data frame. But by default, it just does this operation on only um, numerical data and will ignore any strings. So if you have um, random rows with um, strings in there, it will just ignore it. 
Okay, great. And so for words, how do we how do we count the words? Like we have in a data data frame, we have words instead of numbers. Or I don't know if it's the too advanced question for right now, or maybe. So, so I think we're, 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 we might actually answer some of that um, later on. So uh, we'll we'll do a lot more manipulation with um, data within the data frames. Um, okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um, well, I would encourage you to maybe have a little play around with this um, later on. And in fact, um, for the next two topics, um, I'll probably leave the um, exercise as kind of homework for tomorrow. So you can, so we can actually cover uh, all the bits and then you can have a little play around with it um, at your own in time and, and pace. And if you have any questions about it, we can revisit that uh, tomorrow. Because so far, we've just kind of scratched the surface of um, uh, data frames. So let's see if we can um, a get some more information on statistics and b um, start plotting some very basic information from from data frames. Uh, right, so um, yeah, so effectively data frames are a collection of series and pandas is really built on top of a library called NumPy, which is uh, short for numerical Python library, um, which has a lot of um, 
built in in methods to manipulate arrays and data series and also get um, really nice uh, statistical information out of it. And that's kind of how mean and um, standard deviation and things like this get extracted in this uh, describe function. So how do we actually get entries out of a data frame? Because at the moment we've just kind of looked at it in a sort of very general as a data frame sense, but we might be interested in a specific row or a subsection of rows um, or, or columns. So <clears throat> there's two, two ways of selecting values within um, a data frame. You can do that by um, location or by label effectively. So um, say we want to access entry i and j in our data frame. Um, we can do that by using the index i and j, or we can use the labels that are uniquely defined based on, on my row and, and column headers. So I'm going to uh, read in a new data set, uh, the Euro, Euro, Europe data set rather than the Australia one because, or the Oceania one because that doesn't have that much data. So I'm gonna redefine uh, my data frame as pd.readcsv. <coughs> Data, uh, oh, no, hang on. I need to do this. Uh, so, Gapminder GDP Europe is what we're going to look at now. And uh, I'm going to use this index uh, call uh, country identifier again. And now, say I want to look at, so this again, gives me lots of countries and uh, the GDPs again. Say I want to access my first row and first element of that row. I can use the index method of accessing it. So if I use print data dot I lock, so that's the index location. Uh, zero, zero, because we're still counting from zero in Python. Um, that should give me um, this entry here. And if we compare that to the whole data frame, that is exactly that entry. So one, one uh, would give me the next one in um, in the diagonal of my, my matrix effectively. Um, if I wanted to go along my uh, my row, uh, I use the, the second index. And if I wanted to go along my column, uh, right. Yeah, if I wanted to go along my column, so this is three ones, so I'm going zero, one, two, three, and zero, one, I end up with this entry here, which is exactly what is printed there. Um, the other thing you can use rather than using this I lock, um, so the index location, we can, we can use um, something called lock, and that selects values by the entry label. So the entry label of 00, zero would be GDP per cap 1952 and Albania. So I can do this by using lock rather than I lock. Um, and now I say I want my row, which is Albania. And I would like my column, which is GDP per cap underscore 1952. And again, I get the same information, but I've now used my 
column and, and row labels effectively. <clears throat> I can uh, use a colon to select an entire row or column. So if I wanted to uh, look at all of Albania, I can use print data dot lock um, Albania comma colon. And now I get all the, the years uh, and per capita GDP for Albania uh, back. Um, <clears throat> so you can do um, this as well by getting rid of the colon and that will print the same thing that will just select the whole uh, row in this case. Um, you can also select um, <clears throat> columns if you want. So in this case, use the colon first and then um, you need to give it the appropriate uh, column name. So GDP per cap in 1952. Um, and that will give you the GDP of all the countries in Europe that are in this table uh, with the GDP from 1952. So you can use multiple, or you can select multiple columns um, or rows using this um, labeled location um, by using named slices. So say we want to have all the data from 1962 to 1972 uh, for countries between Italy and Poland. So this is kind of similar to the slicing we did with the, the strings earlier today, uh, but now we use data.log and then say, I would like Italy to Poland, um, comma, G, GDP per cap 1962 to GDP per cap 1972. And that effectively gives me back a, a new data frame, but that is a subset of the original uh, data frame. So I could assign that to a new variable um, that would then only contain that subset um, of information. So what we can do with that slicing information is obviously work on it more than just print it because we're probably more interested in doing some statistical operations on it rather than um, just printing things. So I could just add a dot max function here at the end and that will basically print out the maximum GDP for each year. So if we just compare um, the previous printout to this, it will look at the maximum number in my column and pick out the largest one. So that would be uh, this one and this one and this one. And it is, can, it is always Norway. Um, but yeah, you can just figure out where in this table is, no, what, what is the value of the maximum in, in each column uh, of that table effectively. Um, unsurprisingly, 
you could change the max to the minimum and it will do the same thing for minimum, uh, picking Montenegro. Um, <clears throat> you can do certain comparisons. Um, so as I said, what you can, uh, rather than having just a printout, we can just assign a new variable to our subset of data. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of this print statement and say subset equals data. And then if I look at subset, whoops, that is this new smaller data frame. And um, what if I want to know where in this table are values greater than 10,000? So I can basically give it something called a, a mask effectively. Um, where are values large, question mark. Um, and I say subset larger than 10,000. So now I get back a data table again. And every time the value is, is larger than 10,000, it will print true. And if it's smaller than 10,000, it will print false. Um, so yeah, what, what we've basically done is create a mask on the data that tells us where that condition applies within uh, this, this data set. Um, because we might be able to um, effectively apply this um, in, in a slightly different way where rather than just sort of printing out this information, um, what I could do is actually call this a mask and say subset larger than 10,000. And then I can plug that effectively back into my subset and uh, apply that mask. And now it will only print out the, the numbers where, where it was true before. And suddenly um, where everything was false, these entries uh, turn into uh, not a number. Uh, not a number is a very useful um, way of, of assigning values you want to have ignored in your data table. Um, because effectively, if you do any kind of operation like max or min or average, uh, not a number is, is ignored in it. So you can really um, weed out information that way uh, you, you don't want. Um, now, kind of plugging it all back together, um, we can use the describe function from before. So we have subset of mask dot describe, uh, which now means I can get statistics on, on this data set where <coughs> I've only looked at countries, or no, I've only looked at uh, GDP values of larger than 10,000. Um, so for example, in the first year, I know I only have two countries that have a GDP larger than 10,000, whereas in, um, 1967 and 72, I actually have three countries that are larger than 10,000. And then uh, again, it gives you the sort of mean and standard deviation of, of that um, statistics. Um, 
<clears throat> Pandas uh, vectorizing methods and grouping operations are features that are provide that uh, can provide you with uh, much flexibility in your analysis effectively. Um, <clears throat> so you can really split data in, in a way you might want to analyze it. So you might want to split countries um, based on a lower GDP and countries um, based on a higher GDP and then kind of analyze these separately uh, quite, quite easily. Um, so let's define something called um, a wealth score effectively. Um, and we use a, a, a mask on this. So um, when we went, went to estimate a sort of a wealthy score based on this historical data, um, we want to count how many times a country ha has participated in a group that has lower GDP or a group that has higher GDP. Um, and how do we define lower and higher? Well, we can say, what if it's um, larger than the average GDP of Europe, then it belongs to the higher group of countries. And if it's um, if it has less than the average GDP, then it belongs in the the lower group of countries. So rather than using uh, just a random number, 10,000, we can adjust it. So um, <clears throat> if we go back to the original data frame, we can look at data.mean. And data.mean gives us a mean GDP per year. Um, and we can, again, define a mask. Um, where data is larger than data mean. So we have this lovely table that now selects countries that have higher than average uh, wealth and countries that have lower than average wealth. Um, and I can define that mask as uh, mask higher. If I now want to define a wealth score based on, on, on this information. Um, I could say something like wealth score equals mask higher dot aggregate, aggregate, oh, okay. Doing lots of spelling, mask higher dot aggregate. So what does that? So let's define this and uh, let's have a look at aggregate. So aggregate uses one or more operations over the specified axes. So um, that sounds very complicated. Um, <clears throat> effectively, what you can do is sum over axes equals one. Um, so the, the axis is either the rows or the columns. Um, and um, that kind of lets you do, do a running sum over, over that part. Um, so I can, so the, the function, um, you, we want to use um, are basically functions that exist in in your NumPy library. So um, sum, mean, max, min, um, <clears throat> and we want to sum over all the countries that are larger than 
uh, that have this this uh, where, where this mask is true effectively. Um, X is equal one, and then um, you can normalize that over the length of how many or the, the number of data points in columns. So that's the number of countries in total. Uh, and that now effectively gives me a score as to how many times a country over the years 1960 or 1952 to uh, 2007 has been in that category where the mean, where the, the GDP of the country is larger than the GDP, than the mean GDP of Europe. Um, so you can see that unsurprisingly countries like Austria or Belgium um, have a wealth score for one, which means that every single year uh, where the data exists, the, the GDP was larger than, um, than your average GDP of, of Europe. And then you have other countries uh, where the average GDP has always been below. So Romania, Serbia, um, kind of countries that are not that surprising. Um, where, where that is true. So you can really in in very short number of lines, you can get quite a lot of information out that would normally require quite a lot of uh, uh, programming. Um, right, so last five minutes. Um, I will show how to do very basic plotting. I would highly recommend uh, you taking a look at the um, exercises of this particular section. Uh, also, I appreciate that this last example might be quite advanced for not really having operated on, on um, this kind of data and particularly also using things like sum as a function, as an argument to another function. So it becomes, um, yeah, it becomes a bit convoluted, but I think just kind of practicing with these, this kind of syntax and playing around with it yourself a little bit um, gives you a bit more of a feel of what is actually happening. Um, so yeah, this is something I will probably pick up. No, not probably. I'll definitely pick up on tomorrow. Um, because there's many different ways of plotting things in um, Python and particularly with pandas, but I'm gonna show you one way of, of uh, plotting things before we break for today. So um, I'm just gonna throw in another heading here. Um, so let's go back to that Oceania data set because it's got two countries in there. So it's, it's a nice and easy one to plot without having to extract bits from, from that um, data frame too much. So pd.read um, CSV, oh, that does not look CSV. Um, data. Okay, so we have our Oceania data set back um, with our two countries, Australia and New Zealand. So let's plot um, something. How about Australia? Um, the value of GDP of Australia for the different years. Um, so what you can do is remove, yeah, so, so what we want to plot is um, 
on our x-axis, the years, and then on our y-axis, the, the GDP value. Um, the years we effectively have given here is column uh, values, but we have this weird GDP per cap underscore bit in front of it. So there's a, a way to basically strip that part of a string away. And that is um, unsurprisingly a function called strip. So you can say years equals data dot columns, which is what we've encountered before. And then we can use the strip functionality from string. So dot string dot strip, it gets uh, a bit many dots here. Um, and then we just type GDP per cap underscore. So if I execute this and now look at years, I end up with an array of just years um, without the, the pre factor. Um, now we would like to actually set how do we now take these years, turn them into integer values and set them as the columns of the data frame? Well, we can say data dot columns, columns equals years dot as type int. And this is uh, going back to the question when you asked me, oh, what do you do with string values? So what I'm effectively doing now is I'm taking this list of string uh, years I set them as my column headers uh, in my data frame, but I'm converting them to type integer. So if I now look at my data frame again, I now have column headings that are just these lovely years, which we should be able to plot with the data within um, each of these um, uh, data frames or within this data frame with the GDP data. So data.lock, uh, just a reminder, uh, will Australia will now select my entire row of Australian GDPs and the, the column values as well. And now pandas is really nice because it's got this inbuilt functionality where I can just say dot plot and it will now take my years and the GDP values and provide me with a plot of years against GDP. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll leave it at this because um, effectively, yeah, we, we are in the sort of uh, tidying up loose ends bit of uh, today's session. I will uh, pick up again from the plotting tomorrow morning and exploring different ways of plotting data with pandas and without pandas and um, how to um, how, how to manipulate um, the the pandas uh, data frame information to really get the kind of plot you might want. So how do I get a bar plot and, and, and questions like this? Um, I would highly encourage you to look at the examples um, from the following. Um, oh, where's my chat? chat. Uh, yeah, from from the manipulating um, data and getting statistics out. So there, there's the exercises at the bottom. Have a look at that, and if you want to um, have a look at the the plotting exercises as well, please uh, go ahead. Otherwise, we will discuss this uh, first thing tomorrow morning. Um, as far as sort of the introduction to Python and pandas goes, this is um, the end of the first session now. Um, I'll be around for another 10 minutes if you want to ask any questions. Um, but effectively, yeah, we'll just be resuming tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, same time, same place, uh, kind of diving more into the, the plotting part of things.
Thanks very so, much, Tony. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, also, you guys being acousticians and all, uh, I popped in a little example of uh, called tying it all together. Uh, so basically, using only the standard libraries, how you go about just writing out a very simple web file and sort of uh, everything that Tony's covered today, uh, just, yeah, applying all that to then making some sound. Right. Thanks very much. Can we also ask people to head uh, before they go to lunch to head to Etherpad, and then just just give us some feedback on on the morning session from line sixty two, just things that um, that you liked, um, and maybe things that we can um, work to improve upon. It's yeah. line one hundred sixty five now. Oh. No, yeah, no, but there is if it's anything like it would be helpful if you want something changed for tomorrow. Um, I'm happy to receive feedback that things that were too fast or too slow or um, would be helpful if if I did differently. Uh, that'd be great to hear. And it is line one one six two in the shared document. Right, I'm going to stop sharing now. <laughs>